I hope there is a plan actually. Uh, and I, I have a friend and he went to no chance so that he goes off of one of these bikes that are bunch of cancer. Would you be interested? Look at that And you know, he's also he's a philosopher, he's interested in animal studies. And we're kind of pondering the question is why are we starting to look at animals differently? And you know, it's hard to know because there's, there are cultural conditions that enable uh, paradigm shifts too. There was someone named Aaron Starkis who uh, Kuhn writes about who in, I don't know, fourth or fifth century BC, Athens, proposed a heliocentric solar system, right? So ideas are around all the time. It's just it takes a certain cultural context to I think begin to, to quantify or really understand to enable certain ideas to come to fruition. And uh, one, of, one of the things he said that I think we're thinking about is, you know, maybe it is because the planetary situation is so, so dire that we're, that we have to, uh, there has to be a new consciousness about our relationship to it. And that maybe that's coming back to the kind of cultural, almost like a zeitgeist background to this emerging event and you know, a reconsideration of a lot of the truisms. And I also think um, because we've reached um, perhaps in one way the end of our uh, relationship with technology in some way mm -hmm. um, to use uh, Martin Heidegger which kind of describes this problem problematic or non-linear, so some of it I think also can be made available. But I mean, you know, he's talking about uh, techie technology, the technical instrumental view of the world. And I think that um, we're, we're maybe reaching the end of our romance with that. Um, and and um, I think that uh, the acceleration of our war on a non-human animal, I mean, I'm comfortable calling it that. Um, it, you know, really occurred with uh, industrial practices, and maybe now that we're uh, seeing the destruction um, in general, that that's raw that we're taking a look at. I think those two things are, and what, what I'm talking about is you know, just referencing that those two things are intertwined in a way. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Uh, just both the we have lots of time. Yeah, the oh, we of time. Yeah. So for those of you that were in, in our talk earlier, you guys know I'm not a critical animal theorist. Um, I don't do animal studies. This is kind of my first interest in this particular field. Uh, I've learned a great deal. I, I, I think that a lot of this stuff is important. But there's a lot of things that just haven't been talked about, and sometimes it feels like it's almost being avoided. Mm -hmm. So, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to ask you a couple of what might not be difficult questions, but for me, to me, feel like really big, big problems. Um, and the first one is for anybody who's who wants to speak up. Um, so, who, I want to understand the the animal and the human hold their own agency. Is that correct? Is that a is that a true statement? For, for your belief system? Uh, well, I think that, um, well, to say the animal is like, there's so many different kinds of animals. Um, but I think it, most of us would say it's probably fair to assume that um, there's a great deal of animals that um, have desire, have a burden to suffering, and um, to that degree, they, at least they're agents. Okay, so what's the what's the cutoff? What what is it that separates something from agency and not? I don't think you should think in terms of the cutoff, but I don't think you should decide where to draw the line. And that's what we're very good at doing. Humans are very good at doing and that's when um, 
culture is, is really the one where I'm not comfortable in saying, because, you know, as you can probably gather, I'm interested in the office and the history of the science of animals. And what has struck me recently is this flurry of scientific research. Um, and with that, every new place that scientists look, when they actually look, they're amazing. So about three years ago, there was this amazing study published about um, prairie dog language. Mm -hmm. And prairie dogs, who knew? Prairie dogs, you know, these big rodents that are endangered in some parts of the country now as the prairie is disappearing. They have quite a complex uh, system of, of linguistic, what I would call them, signs. So that they will, if somebody walks by, and this is published either in PNAS or Nature, I mean, it's a very good journal. The prairie dog will communicate, tall lady wearing yellow jacket who's nice, mm -hmm. or, you know, big jerk and nice. <laughs> so they'll, they'll indicate that the person is nice, something about their physical characteristics, you know, whatever. And it, it was quite complex, I haven't read one in a few years. So, you know, I think probably, maybe if you'd asked me this 10 years ago, you'd say, is that a new dog? So, you know, who knows what I would have said. So, the squid, giant squid have been seen to use tools. Mm -hmm. And black bears in the last couple of years have been seen to use squid. So, the more you look, we know so little. How can we say that we're going to draw the line here? And you have agency, and you deserve. To, to we will pull you closer to our center. Anyway, so that's my answer. What's your answer? <laughs> yeah. So maybe this is more helpful on a theoretical level. But now we've been talking about like if the table has agency, does the graph have agency, and that when we're starting, it's like some things are alive and some things aren't. Like mm -hmm. maybe when you're working finding a lot of indigenous decisions. So. Why do you ask? Uh, well, it, this is this is part of a bigger question. So, um, let's assume then that, just to be kind of hyperbolic, let's assume everything has agency, right? Um, it's not that hyperbolic. Yeah. No, I think everything has agency. Why not give everything the benefit of the doubt until we know otherwise? So, who then has moral responsibility? No agency. I, it's so this. Questions you're asking me are throughout actually literature is about humans and animals and studies. Uh, the first thing I would say is that um, we have to have radical uncertainty, like we're talking about, the panelists are talking about, and then and then you also have to, though, have um, some kind of entry into other bodies to understand them. So we're talking about the gesture and the panel. Um, for me, and you're asking the question of every one of us, as though we're a monolith, and we're not. But for me, my answer is, what, what can we imagine suffered? I don't think the table suffered. So um, uh, perhaps we do need to have radical uncertainty about objects, but I just don't believe that. Um, I can imagine, however, and, it, and then there's, well, what is suffering? I just think of it in terms of pain. And worms have pain, um, worms feel pain. Um, one of the things that is repeated a lot throughout um, critical animal studies is uh, animals go with their feet. They, um, they uh, non-human animals run away from slaughterhouses, they smell death. Some of the questions that get asked of people like us in the room are the wrong questions. They're just simply the wrong question. We're, they, they're questions that are human-centered. And as long as we continue to ask human-centered questions, we're never going to get outside of the human. Um, frankly, um, why don't you ask um, why we don't smell thoughts? Um, and it's a question that uh, Jan Christie asked um, in Disgrace, the novel Disgrace. Why, why, why don't we ask questions like, What's wrong with humans that we can't smell thoughts? Um, so I think that uh, there, there has to be an entrance, but I think that entrance for, for some people 